Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, I know it's Saturday morning. Um, I'm Matt Ahrens. Uh, I helped to create ZFS back in the day at Sun Microsystems. And I'm going to be talking to you today about um, kind of my take on this, some of the things that we did well and, and some things that we missed on and, and future work, uh, focusing on flexible disk use in OpenZFS. So uh, back in 2005, we released ZFS. And we went around giving this talk saying, that our goal is to end the suffering of system administrators. Um, and I want to take a look at like what did we mean by that and, and how did we do. So uh, what we meant was that we wanted, um, we wanted everything to work well together. We wanted, um, when you're using ZFS, there's a lot of features in ZFS. We want all those features to work well together. So you can have snapshots, and you can have dedupe, and you can have uh, replication, et cetera. And all those things work well together. We wanted there to be no sharp edges and have a resilient configuration. So what that means is um, we wanted it to be hard to shoot yourself in the foot, hard to do something that you didn't really mean to do that has a negative impact. Um, and we wanted the con configuration to be resilient in the face of um, accidents or uh, changing requirements in the future. So that if you start with a pool that's two terabytes and then you realize that wasn't enough space, let me add some more. That's something that you can do, and that works really well with all the other features of ZFS. So um, probably not too much of a surprise. Uh, a ZFS developer thinks that ZFS uh, is doing pretty well. <laughs> but uh, here's some of the things that I um, think that uh, have kind of stood the test of time from the original design. So first off, um, file system as the, as the administrative control point. Uh, this has worked really well. And uh, we've been able to, over the years, add lots and lots of properties. and um, having the file system be the point where you apply those properties uh, has worked really well. Um, properties inherit down, so you can say, like, I want, the, I want this thing and everything else underneath it to, ha to be compressed. You don't have to go set, oh, I want your home directory to be compressed, and yours, and yours, and yours, and yours, and yours. You just have to say it once. Um, and then if you want to change it, again, just say it once. Um, another uh, thing that I wanted to call out was the quotas and reservations. Um, we started out with, I think, one kind of quota in reservation. Now we're up to three. And they all kind of work pretty well together. So for those keeping track at home, that's like regular uh, quotas and reservations. Um, ref quotas and reservations, meaning on space that's referenced as opposed to um, space that's used. And then uh, user quotas and, quotas and reservations, or user quotas, there's no reservations, uh, on space used by files that are owned by particular users in ZFS. And those last two were things that we added kind of after the initial deployment of, of ZFS. Um, as I mentioned, you, know, you can add storage, and that's, that's super easy. It's online. Um, you can add new mirrors, RAID Z, et cetera. Um, hello. Will realize it eventually. Let's see, is that still on HDMI? Yes. Yeah, it looks like it's not. Okay. Oh, computer's doing something. Oh, it's very, it's a little confused. I think so. It's trying. Great. Okay. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, oh, so I was mentioning that uh, you can add uh, special devices to accelerate uh, performance, like log and cache devices, and you can remove those devices as well. Um, and the last one that we, we really weren't thinking about very much from the beginning was uh, storage portability between um, 
different operating systems and different releases of ZFS. So you, know, you can take your pool from FreeBSD and use it on Mac OS or uh, Linux, um, assuming that you've selected the right kind of compatibility features. So where have we fallen short? Um, I picked kind of two major areas here. Uh, one is that um, some properties only apply to newly written data. And um, so for example, you know, compression, dedupe. Um, and there's no, so if you, if you write a bunch of data and then you, then you realize, oh, I really should have compressed that. Um, there's no like super easy built-in way to say, hey, just take all that stuff and now I want it to be compressed. So go, go in, like read it and rewrite it all in the background and keep all the relationships of snapshots and block sharing. Um, you can kind of get around this uh, with ZFS send and receive to tell it to rewrite the data, um, but uh, it's not perfect. And the other, the other area is that you really can't reconfigure, reconfigure your primary storage. It's true that you can, you can add storage, which is great, um, but if you add storage, it's added. It's there forever. Uh, it's part of the pool forever. So if you add the wrong disks uh, or in the wrong configuration, then they're stuck as part of the pool. Um, and then similarly, like when you add a RAID Z group, uh, you add five disks, they're part of a RAID Z, then uh, if you want to add more space, you, you have to add another whole RAID Z group. Five more disks, for example. Or do you? So in this talk, I'm going to be talking about two new features in ZFS. Um, one, device removal that uh, helps you if you added the wrong disks, uh, and another, RAID Z expansion, um, which allows you to change the RAID Z configuration. So first, uh, device removal. Um, so what I'm talking about here, dev device removal, just for background, is like you have a storage pool, you have three mirrors, each mirror has two disks, and what, you want, what we want to do is remove one mirror. So we're, 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 we are going to be reducing the total amount of storage in the pool, um, and so we're going to need to like move all the data on this VDEV onto these other VDEVs. Um, this is kind of distinct from say, uh, Zpool detach, which lets you take a mirror and take one disk out of the mirror. In that case, you're affecting the redundancy of the pool, but you're not affecting the usable space. So device removal, we're reducing the amount of usable space here. So um, first of all, like, why would you want to do this? What problems does this solve? So when, uh, when we were originally thinking about this we, uh, at Delphix, we came up with a few use cases, um, and one of them was uh, well, what if customers over-provision their storage? Like, maybe they have like a temporary project where they need a lot of storage, so they add a bunch of disks, um, and then afterwards, they, when they're done with that project, they want to remove the disks so they can use them for something else. Um, has anyone had this problem of over-provisioning their storage? Wow. Oh, okay, that's more hands than I thought. There were, there were about 0.1% of the audience raised their hands. Um, turns out, in practice, uh, our customers haven't had this problem much either. <laughs> they think that they would. Our, our support engineers thought, yeah, that's a really great use case. You should totally go implement this. Um, turns out, people tend to fill up their storage. Who knew? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, second use case here is um, adding the wrong disk or wrong uh, type of VDEV. So uh, for example, if you meant to add something as a log device, but you added it as you, you forget to say log, and you added it as a plain disk uh, to your pool, well, it's stuck as part of the pool now. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of, of how many people have done this. I'm sure, uh, m maybe we can do show of hands. Does anybody have a friend who's <laughs> gotten into this problem? <laughs> um, and, and the last use case here is the one that's really been um, the, the, the biggest one for us at Delphix, is migrating to different, um, device, different storage devices, either size or number. So uh, for example, like if you have 10 one terabyte disks in your pool and uh, you want to migrate all of your storage over to uh, four six terabyte drives. So there's more total storage, but as disks get bigger, maybe you need fewer of them. Um, and uh, th there's kind of some super gross hacky workarounds that you can do with like, oh, I'm gonna attach something to, to make it a mirror and then detach the other one and expand it. And that kind of work in some special cases here. But um, device removal solves this really, really smoothly. So um, how does it work? Um, I'm going to be talking about how it works, and then uh, we're also going to spend a bunch of time on um, kind of how would you use this in practice. So how would you operate this? What are the, what are the practical concerns? Um, but I think an understanding of 
a little bit of what it's doing under the hood will help you to appreciate the, the practical concerns. So um, as I mentioned, we need to find all the allocated space on the device that we want to remove and copy that to um, other disks. So uh, there's another operation in ZFS that has to find all the allocated space <clears throat> and operate on it, um, scrub and resilver, which doesn't have a great reputation for performance. Has anybody, um, has anybody run a scrub or resilver and then several hours or days later found themselves thinking, gee, why, why is this taking so long? <laughs> yeah, okay, like two-thirds of the audience. So um, I was concerned about that same problem here for device removal. So uh, what we've done is um, instead of, uh, so maybe a little bit on how, uh, how Scrub and Resilver works, the way that Scrub and, Scrub and Resilver finds the allocated space is, uh, so ZFS is like a big tree of blocks uh, on disk, and so uh, it walks the tree. So you start at the top, you read everything below that, and then you read everything below that, and you read everything below, below that. So we call it like traversing the block pointer tree. Um, and it, find, it does find all the blocks, uh, but it does so um, with a lot of random reads. And uh, at the end of the day, the, block, the blocks that it finds are, or can be, kind of scattered all across the disk. So you're, you're not finding them in a very, um, uh, you're not finding them in a pleasant order for, for hard disks. You're finding them in more or less random order in terms of offsets on disk. Um, so with device removal, um, we're not doing that. We're finding the allocated space using the space map. So the space map is an on-disk structure that just tells us what part of the which parts of the disks are allocated and which parts are free. And this is a really compact um, data structure uh, relative to, say, the block pointer tree. Um, so it's really fast to find what data to copy. And we find that, uh, that data sequentially. So, um, or we find it in order. Um, so we can uh, traverse over the allocated space in order from the beginning of the disk to the end of the disk. So that means that we're doing sequential reads from the device that we're removing. Um, and the one caveat of this is that the space map doesn't tell us, it only tells us what is, like this range is allocated, this, like this 100 megabytes of space is allocated. It doesn't tell us um, where the blocks are within that. Um, it doesn't tell us what the checksums of, of the blocks are. So when we're doing this, um, we don't have access to the checksums, so we can't do checksum verification. I'll get to some implications of that later on. Okay, cool. So. Um, this is pretty straightforward. All that we got to do is go read all the allocated regions, allocate new space for them on other drives, and then store this mapping from the old locations to the new locations. Um, and we keep that mapping always in memory so that whenever you do a read from uh, the removed device, uh, which we now call an indirect device because it has to indirect through this table, whenever you read from the indirect device, we look in this, uh, in this mapping in memory and it tells us where the new location is. And we just always read that in the pools open. Uh, wait a minute, did he say that we're keeping this always in memory? Like how much memory are we talking about here? Um, so this is actually one of the big operational um, considerations here. Uh, we do take a lot of uh, effort to keep the size of this mapping small and to reduce it when possible uh, because it does need to be kept in memory uh, all the time. So uh, one of the big things that we do to keep this small is to map big chunks whenever possible. So if you think, for example, of <clears throat> a very fragmented storage pool, say, a pool where everything is record size 8K and compressed and 80% full, which is exactly how the pools tend to be uh, for our customers when they go to use this feature, because uh, you know, they only use this when, they're, when their pool is full and they need to move to newer, bigger devices, then they want to do this. Uh, and at that point, the pool is super fragmented and they're using a database, so they're using small record size. And, and we tend to see this with pools with like a fragmentation rating of above 70% and, and sometimes as high as like 90%, which is really quite fragmented. Um, and so if we were to, so I showed this um, e as like taking each little allocated thing and moving it somewhere else. If we were, there could be like billions and billions of individual allocated segments um, with free space between them um, on the storage pool on a very fragmented pool. So that could result in a, a huge number of mappings. But instead what we do is um, when possible, we see, oh, here's a run. There's like 
Uh, there's five species of allocated space, and there's free space between each one, but they're all pretty close together. Like this is, this is maybe you know, one megabyte uh, with four little holes inside of it. Let's find one megabyte somewhere else, allocate that, and then copy this just as it is with those little holes in, in between it, and that way we can just use one mapping that says this whole meg is now mapped over there. Um, so that we only need one entry in the mapping table. So this, that, um, that feature is about a 10x or more reduction in the amount of uh, memory used on highly fragmented pools. And then the other, um, the next thing that we do to, to reduce this is um, we track and remove obsolete entries over time. So let's take that previous entry where we had like five allocated regions with holes between them. We map them over here. Um, we can keep track of when, uh, when, so for example, if all this data is freed, then we know, well, that mapping isn't useful anymore. So we can remove the mapping from uh, our table. Um, and there is, uh, additionally, in addition to being freed, there is something called uh, ZFS remap. So we're doing this, remap is something that we do all the time in the background. Whenever we write uh, an indirect block that has some block pointers that point to uh, an indirect VDEV, different kind of indirect there. Um, but basically, whenever we're writing a new block pointer, even if it's like a, a, just a copy of an old block pointer, we're going to check and see, is that pointing to an indirect VDEV and through this mapping? And if so, can I change that pointer to point to the new concrete location directly? In that case, then um, I can uh, hopefully be able to get rid of that mapping entry. Um, so over time, the amount of, uh, mapping of needed entries will decrease and we'll uh, clean them up, reducing the amount of memory. Um, and then lastly, uh, if you want to force ZFS to go do this rewriting proactively, we added a ZFS remap subcommand. You give it a file system, and then it, uh, it walks all of the metadata in that file system and rewrites it uh, using as concrete mappings as possible. Um, let, me, uh, let me go a few more slides before. I, I, see, I see your two questions. We'll, we'll get there in just a sec. Um, yeah, we're still doing good on time. We'll have time for your questions. Don't worry. So, um, all right, I wanted to uh, briefly talk about two, so all the stuff that I said, it's like, yeah, sure, that makes sense, easy, right? Um, I wanted to highlight just two things that are a little bit, tr uh, a little or a lot bit tricky about this. Um, first, uh, you know, we're doing this while the pool is in operation. So, you know, you, you run ZFS, uh, ZPool remove, and you can still do whatever you want with the pool. You know, take snapshots, write data, free data, et cetera. Um, so, what happens when we're doing freeze from the device that we're in the middle of removing? Um, we, don't, we don't have to handle Alex because we can say, oh, you're removing this device, no more allocations allowed to that device. So uh, there won't be any more allocations. There won't be any more writes. Therefore, asterisk, there's some caveats there, but, um, but, but there could still be freeze to this device that we're in the middle of removing. So if, uh, if we haven't yet copied the data, then that's easy. We just free it from the uh, old location, the old and only location, and then when we get to that, uh, we won't copy it because it's not free. Um, what if it was uh, already copied? Well, then there's really two locations allocated for this data, the old and the new location, so we need to free both of those. What if we're in the middle of copying it? Um, this is a little bit of a special case because uh, it's, it's kind of like the already copied because we've already allocated space for the new version of it. Um, but what if we're, like, we've, we've uh, read from the old location, we've allocated the new location, we've issued the write for the new location, but the write hasn't completed yet. If we were to free the new location immediately, then it could be reallocated, and then someone else could do a write to that same location, and then one of those writes would win, uh, and, the, uh, and the other one would get corrupted. So uh, we need to do the same thing where we free from both the old and the new location, but we defer the freeing of the new location until the end of the transaction group when the um, copy, we, we defer until we know that the write has completed, the write uh, to the new location has completed, and, and that happens um, at the end of the transaction group uh, when that is taking effect. All right, I wanted to mention one more tricky thing, uh, which is split blocks. So. Uh, you know, I mentioned we're finding the allocated space using the space map. It tells us, like, this 100 megabytes is allocated. 
it doesn't tell us where the blocks are inside of that, or where the boundaries between the blocks are. So uh, let's say this is, this is 100 megabytes that's allocated, and we want to go allocate a new 100 megabytes for it somewhere else, but we don't actually have a contiguous 100 megabytes. So we have to split this allocated region into two chunks, the blue and the purple, allocate the first part of it over here and the, and the last part of it here. Well, if there was one logical block that straddled this boundary, uh, then say, like, this part is one logical block, then the first, when we go to read that, the first part of the logical block is here, and the second part is here. So when we uh, look in the mapping table, we need to obviously take that into account, and, and one, one read might turn into two, two reads in this case. Um, and that is uh, pretty, that aspect of it is pretty straightforward. I'll, uh, um, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll talk about this now. So the, um, uh, I'll, I'll use a different diagram to talk about that, actually. So reads, we just need to take, take we need to remember this. Um, there's some other operations that get more complicated. Uh, so let me take questions now before, we, the next section is going to be on kind of operating this, and so let me take questions about how it works. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So the, the question was, um, when you do the ZFS remap, it's, it's reading all the indirect blocks, and you'll have a similar I.O. pattern with Scrubber or Silver. That's right. Um, the ZFS remap is specific to a file system, or, uh, or ZVOL or clone. So you have more control over what exactly is being operated on. Um, so for example, the way we use it in our product is after the device, we, we have um, uh, a file system, and then lots and lots of clones of that. So the file system cont contains a database, and then the clones all contain virtual databases, copies of that that are being used for different purposes. Um, so because there could be lots of uh, clones, and the metadata in the clones is just as big as, the, you know, there's just as much metadata referenced in the clones as in the file system, we didn't want to go remap all the clones. So instead we say we're going to remap all the file systems, but not the clones. And then we'll wait for those clones to age out, be destroyed, and new versions of them created, so that uh, the storage overhead of, of doing the remap operation is relatively low. Um, and then you have to wait some time for the old um, snapshots and clones to age out. Uh, was there another question? Yeah, so the ZFS remap, um, it, it works in open context, and uh, it's spread over multiple transaction groups, so it's a nice kind of background thing. Um, the one uh, kind of uh, gotcha with it is that um, it, it runs in open context, uh, so other things are happening at the same time, but um, the command doesn't return until the remap is done, and the remap isn't, um, so you, obviously you, you would want to run it in the background, um, and uh, we don't record on disk the fact that you started the remap and the remap is in progress, et cetera. So, but it's, uh, it's unimportant. So essentially the idea is like, if, if it fails or if you reboot or whatever, then you'd use whatever logic you did originally to determine that you wanted to do that remap and then just issue it again. And it would skip over, it would notice, oh, like there's nothing here in the beginning of the, fi of the, pool of the file system that needs to be remapped, so it would just skip over it. Uh, s same idea. You would, you would need to apply the same logic to determine that you want to do the remap and do it again. Um, but, the, but the progress that you've made would be, you know, that's already been written to disk uh, by the virtue of actually remapping the blocks. Uh, okay. Let me take a question over here. Hold on for a few slides. Um, not explicitly uh, for the for the remap operation. Yeah, maybe. Um, so let me let, let me move on to kind of operational concerns. Uh, how to how to use this? So there there is one big caveat. It doesn't work with RAID Z. So it works with plain plain disks and mirrors. Um, RAID Z is is 
a bit more complicated because uh, because of well because of some stuff that we'll cover more in the next section um, relating to the fact that uh, w with RAID Z uh, allocations include both the data and the parity, and we need to be more careful about, um, for example, split blocks to ensure that the the each individual sector of the RAID Z would ha would fall on different disks, different physical disks, um, even even with split blocks after the fact. Um, and and there's some sm there's there's also a, a small caveat, which is that all the disks have to be the same A shift, meaning they all have the same sector size. This is typically the case, uh, so not, not a big concern in practice. All right, so uh, you like what I've said so far? You're like, great, device removal. I want to do it. How do I do it? Um, first, before you do it, you want to check how much memory um, uh, w could be used after the removal completes. So we have this uh, zpool remove dash n for no op mode, uh, and then the name of the pool, the name of the disk. It's going to tell you, all right, this is how much memory I think will be used. This tends to be an, an overestimate. I think um, I've seen it be anywhere from like, in practice, the real amount used is maybe half to three quarters of what this estimates typically. Um, if you're like, great, 37 megs, I can deal with that. Um, then Z pool remove, name of the pool, name of the disk. Uh, while that's in progress, this is this is a zpool operation. Um, you know, we, we record on disk. We're, we we are doing this. If you if you well, I'll get to that in the next slide. So, um, it, while you're in the middle of this, you can check the status. And it tells you, you know, I'm in the middle of removing this device. I'm copying the data off of it. Uh, you started at this time. This is how much I've done so far, um, and it's uh, a rough estimate of uh, how much time we have left before this completes. Um, if if you realize in the middle of this, whoops, like, um, gee, this is supposed to take, this is supposed to happen overnight, and it's not done yet, and my user is about to start using the pool, and you know the device removal does have some uh, performance cost while it's in progress. So actually, let's never mind that. Um, you can uh, you can cancel the removal with the zpool remove s for stop, uh, and uh, it'll be canceled. And to do that in practice, basically we need to go free all the new locations of the data that we've copied so far. Um, so uh, someone asked, uh, what happens if you lose power? Um, so the, Z, the device removal will pick up where it left off. Um, it, it remembers how much progress it made every TXG. Um, and this works online with, all, with pretty much everything else. So you can, of course, snapshot, read, write, et cetera. You can do Z, some zpool operations like um, adding new storage while this is in progress uh, or other things. There's one, one little caveat, zpool checkpoint, which is a very new feature. It's kind of like a snapshot for your entire storage pool. And um, uh, the point is that you can like take this ch checkpoint of your entire pool and then rewind back to it later. Well, if you've removed a device, then that, that doesn't really work with that. So um, that's, that's the one exception to being able to do stuff while this is in progress. Uh, yes, there was a question. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. And uh, I did not implement that. So, um, oh, sorry. The, the question was, could I pause the removal rather than canceling it? Um, say, because you want to resume it again the next evening or, or next weekend when when there's light activity. Um, I think that's a great idea, um, but I didn't implement it. So, area of future work. Was there another question? Yes. Doesn't stopping it effectively stopping it right there, and everything that's been moved is now unallocated on the original. No. No. So um, when you stop the removal, uh, the uh, the like real home of the storage is where it was originally. Yeah. So it's it's truly like cancel and un like undo that. Um, so after the removal, uh, and and the reason for that is because you know one of the reasons that you might cancel it is uh, because you realize that you have concerns about the memory usage. So um, by this by implementing the cancellation this way, you know when it's done like. There's no indirect anything, and everything uh, everything is back the way it was before. Sure, one more question. Let's. The cancellation is very quick, because we have that uh, allocation data in memory. Okay, so you're not grouped. Got it. Um, so. After the removal completes, uh, 
it kind of like Zipl scrub, it tells you information about the last removal. So um, it tells you, okay, I removed this VDEV0. I, it took me this much time to copy it. And then it also tells you this last line about how much memory is used, and that applies to all the removals that have taken place. Um, so, uh, um, so if you've done, you know, you can remove multiple devices over time if you'd like. And, and this tells you how much memory is used for all the, for the, all the mappings of all the removed devices. Let me, okay, let, me, let me get to the end of this section, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, so I mentioned this as ZFS remap operation. It helps to shrink the mapping faster. You can run this after the removal completes. Um, okay, so performance. So there's kind of two things that we want to think about in terms of performance impact. One is the performance impact while we're in the middle of the removal, um, and the other is performance impact after the removal completes. So while we're in the middle of the removal, well, as we mentioned, we have to copy all the data. So this is not going to be free. Um, but at least the reads are sequential. And the writes are as however the writes would be in your pool otherwise. So if you, if you, have, if you just added a bunch of new, totally unallocated disks, then the ZFS is going to be able to do big, nice sequential allocations. And so the writes will also be sequential. If the pool is super fragmented, then uh, that won't be the case. Um, there's a new VDEV Q uh, type um, for these re removal IOs. Um, it's the lowest priority, and uh, by default, we set that to Q depth of two, so we'll send at most two uh, removal IOs to each disk at once. Um, and you know, this, this can take a while. Uh, it, to be honest, we kind of concern ourselves more with the impact of the performance, the impact to the performance of the rest of the pool while the operation is in progress, rather than like making removal go as fast as humanly possible. Just a minute. Um, so the performance, uh, uh, then the other aspect of performance is after the removal completes. Um, so there's a, a couple things we want to worry about there. One, memory use, uh, which we mentioned. You, you, you can check that with the zipl status. And really, the other aspects of this, there are um, other things that we need to do because you have a removed device. But the performance impact of these is, is pretty negligible. So for example, when the pool is opened, we need to read this mapping from disk and put it in memory. Um, and then whenever we do a read from an indirect removed device, then we have to look up in the mapping, um, which is O of log of the number of entries. Um, but that tends to be pre pretty small overhead compared to all the other uh, things we need to do when we're doing uh, an IO. Um, and then lastly, we need to track which parts of the mappings are obsolete. This is probably the, the, the biggest of these three um, small impacts. This is kind of similar to the way that we need to track um, uh, space that's, uh, w w like when you free, uh, when you remove a file and the file might be referenced by some snapshots, we need to keep track of that fact. And then um, when the snapshots go away, then know to actually free the data. And this is kind of a similar operation here. So. Folks typically don't notice the impact of that um, space tracking for snapshots, and, and so I think that this will be similar. Uh, OK. One more impact. What's the impact on redundancy? So um, if you only have one, if you don't have any redundancy in the pool to begin with, then uh, you know, it's, it's fine. It's the same. <laughs> if you have uh, mirrors, then um, we preserve all the copies of the data in the mirrors. So, uh, as we mentioned before, we aren't verifying the checksums when we, when we uh, read the data here. So when we read something, we don't know whether it's actually the right data or not. We don't want to get into a situation where there's been um, some silent damage, and we make that damage permanent. So um, for example, you can imagine like we have a mirror. One si like we think that the mirror is, f is fine and healthy, but one side of it, actually, the data has been corrupted. If we only read from that side and then wrote it to the new location, both sides of the new location, then we would, have kind of, we would have left some good data uh, behind. So instead of what we do is we read from both sides of the mirror, and then we write that data to, you know, we read from the left and write to the left of the new location, read from the right and write to the right side of the, right side of the mirror of the new location. So um, this way uh, we're able to, uh, when you do a read, when you later read the block through the normal code path, um, you know, catting the file or whatever, then, or doing a scrub, um, then you know, 
will check the checksum and say, oh, this side has, this, this side actually, this doesn't actually have the right data. It, not, it doesn't match the checksum. And so then we'll go to the other side, and that should have the right data. So we're able to do this uh, silent damage detection and correction, um, even for things like split blocks. So this gets a little, a little crazily complicated because the split block could have data, um, one logical block could have its data both here and here, and we need to figure out like, what if there's silent damage here and here, and so I need to read from these ones. Uh, and I mentioned that we don't verify the checksums. The, the, real, the only real um, concern about this is that transient, transient errors could become permanent. So for example, we have a mirror here, and um, you know, normally if we do a read, and we read from this side of the mirror and we get the wrong data, we verify the checksum, it says we have the wrong data, we would immediately do a write over that to correct it. Um, with, uh, when we're doing the device removal, we read from this side, we just take whatever it gives us at face value and, and write it over here. If, that, if, if the error was transient, meaning like it gave us the wrong, error, the, the wrong data this time, but if, if we happen to read it, read it again, it would give us the right data, then um, we've made that a bit worse here because uh, we just wrote the wrong data over here. Um, these types of transient errors tend to not, um, they tend to not be very common on spinning disks, but uh, they tend, because like spinning disks, they already have like tons of um, ECC code down there in the actual hardware and they're doing all kinds of reconstructions to get it and like if, they're like, well, like, this is what I got. Um, but basically the more software you have uh, underneath ZFS, the, the more likely these are to occur because they're typically due to software bugs, race conditions and stuff in say an SSD or um, you know, s some fancy um, fiber channel based array that you're accessing over your SAN. Okay. Um, so I wanted to thank uh, other folks who have helped to do this. I didn't uh, implement this all on my own. So um, Alex, Seraphim, and Purushanth, who uh, are my, my colleagues at Delphix, and then uh, Brian and Tim from the ZFS and Linux community who, who also helped with this. We've been using this in production at Delphix uh, for three years or so, um, and then uh, it's been integrated into uh, Lumos, FreeBSD, and ZFS on Linux uh, just this year. And it's in uh, FreeBSD 11.2. Cool, so I'm, I'm a little bit behind time, but I'll take a couple of questions before we move on to RAID-Z expansion. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Can you remove them all once or do you remove them? Um, so uh, you have to remove them one after the other. Uh, that's actually an area of, of feature work that we'd like to let you um, queue up multiple de devices for removal. Um, that'll make it easier operationally to say like, hey, how much space will be, how much memory will be used after I remove all of these? And then also um, to like, if, if I know that you want to remove this, then I'll make sure, I'll make really sure to never allocate any space on that. Um, but that's that's an uh, area of future improvement. Was there one more question before we move on? Yes. The, 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 um, the mapping is stored both in memory and on disk. So the in memory is just a cache of what's on disk. Um, that, that we, so we, we store it in memory for performance sake when you need to read it. And then um, there's also a bunch of like crazy code paths because like we're in the middle of doing a read, we can't do another read to the DMU and et cetera, et cetera. One, one more question. You were talking about transient errors. Mm -hmm. Would it make sense to describe first on the, on the pool that you're going to remove? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you're super paranoid, um, I would def definitely, like, you could do a scrub before you do the removal, um, and you could do a scrub after you do the removal, even. Um, uh, if you, you know, if you're cool with kind of the performance in impact of that, then um, doing a scrub before the removal is probably a good idea. All right, I'm a little bit behind time, so I'm going to move on to RAID-Z expansion. Okay. The problem space is a little, a little simpler here. You have a RAID Z VDEV, and you have like uh, four disks and you want to add another one. Has anybody had this problem? 
Oh, quite, a, quite a few. All right, cool. So how does it work? Um, we need to rewrite all the data using the new physical stripe width. Um, so this is going to increase the total usable space, uh, kind of the opposite of the last operation we talked about, um, and uh, without changing the data to parity relationship. So I think it's useful to think about, uh, first think about um, how this could work with traditional RAID, and then talk about kind of the contrasts with RAID-Z. So uh, with traditional RAID, uh, we're showing here four disks, and we're adding a fifth disk, um, and a single parity. So in, in this example, this is like RAID 4, because uh, it's kind of easier to see than RAID 5. Um, so we have data, 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 and then parity. And the parity here um, is the parity of these three other disks uh, in that row. So to, to add the disk, basically what we're doing is making it wider. You can think of it kind of like uh, in your text editor. You, if you make the window wider, then like all the words reflow to the new width of it. It's exactly like that. So it's kind of like we're just renumbering where the data is. Instead of going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, we say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, and uh, I've used color here to indicate um, the logical stripes, which are in this case are the same as the physical stripes. But so like the pink here is, is telling us that this, this parity is the parity of these other three pink blocks. Uh, and the green here, this is the parity of this data. And, and, and here, this is the parity of this data. So um, obviously, in this case, the parity of 1 to 3 is different than the parity of 1 to 4. So we would need to recalculate the parity um, for, for all this. But we know very straightforwardly how to do that, because the parity is just in a fixed location. And so you, know, you can imagine, like, we read, we read block 4, we write it there, and then we read 1 through 3 to calculate the new parity, uh, parity, parity of 1 through 4. RAID Z uh, is a little bit more, it, RAID Z looks a little more complicated, and conceptually, uh, there's a bunch more stuff to think about here. But uh, in practice, it turns out that it's actually simpler than what I just described for, for traditional RAID. So uh, with RAID Z, um, the key thing is that uh, when we do an allocate, when we allocate space with RAID Z, we're allocating space for both the data and the parity. So the uh, logical stripe might be different than the physical stripe, meaning that um, the, we don't know, uh, just from looking at the layout of the disks, where the parity is. So for example, um, you know, in the second row here, five, six, seven, eight, um, I'm showing you an example where perhaps the first logical block has four sectors, one, uh, two, three, four, and six. That's, that's, your, logic, that's your data. And then uh, we've allocated two additional parity sectors for that. One, which is the parity of 2, 3, 4, and 5, which is the parity of 6, which is kind of a degenerate case where it's just the, the XOR of it, or the inverse of it. Um, and so you can get in situations where, say, here, like, you have uh, another, uh, another block, say, with uh, four, data, uh, four sectors of data, and you have 7, 8, 9, 10, where 7 is the parity of 8, 9, 10, and then uh, 11 is the parity of 12. So obviously, this makes for a much uh, more complicated and prettier picture, in my opinion, um, color-wise. Uh, but, but there's a little bit more there to think about. So the, the cool thing, though, about it when we do expansion is that, again, we're going to add a new disk. We're going to reflow into uh, this larger numbering scheme. But in this case, uh, we're including the parity information in the reflow. So the parity information stays the same as it was previously, because that parity is attached to the logical block rather than to the physical stripe. Um, so this is just showing um, exactly that reflow, where we've, we've reflowed both the data and the parity. You know, one, instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in the first row. And um, the, the key thing that makes this possible is that, um, well, the key thing that makes RAID possible at all, in general, is that um, for any logical stripe, the parity and all the data that it's the parity of are each on different disks. So that's true here, right? This, this parity and the, the data that it's the parity of are all on different disks. And after the expansion in the, the traditional case, that's still the case. So that, uh, that, that needs to be true so that if we lose one of these disks, we've only lost one sector of any given um, logical row. With RAID-Z, that's also the case. 
Um, so for example, if we were to lose this one, we lost like these two parity, but, but they were of different logical rows. Um, and, and similarly, like here, if we lost this, we, we would lose both 15 and 19, um, but those are parts of different, log different logical rows. And the same co comes in the new scheme. So if we lose this disk, we can only lose one from this blue row and one from this purple row. So we can still reconstruct the data after the fact. Um, and, and this is why you, you couldn't really imagine, you could imagine like a RAID-Z contraction where we like remove one of the disks and reflow it to be narrower, but that wouldn't work because uh, then you would necessarily end up with like two sectors of one logical row on the same device. And so if you lost that device, then you would lose data. And, and with RAID-Z, um, obviously we, we know what data is allocated in Freed, so we don't need to copy, we don't need to actually move the unallocated data. Um, we're going to find the allocated space using the space map, just like in the device removal case. So uh, you have kind of similar implications. We find the data sequentially, so this goes as sequential as possible. Um, and in this case, both the reads and the writes are as sequential as possible because we aren't allocating new space for the writes. The, the, new, spa the new locations of the writes are determined statically. Okay, cool. I think this is, this is what I just said. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to, let's see, before I move on to operations, operating this, um, I'll take like two questions if we have some. Yes. Um, not necessarily. That, that doesn't. That doesn't. Um, that isn't really required or, or helpful. Um, but but if we have time at the end, I'll talk some more about how RAID, uh, RAID Z removal could work. Yes. Checks on verification still happen after the operation is complete. Yes. Right? Yeah. So after. I mean, after and while the operation is complete, when you do a read, we verify the checksum. Like when you do a read of a file, um, we verify the checksum and we do reconstruction. Um, if the checksum is bad, and, and I'll get to some points about how crazy that is. If we have time, I'll get to some points about how crazy that is with uh, RAID-Z expansion. All right, cool. Um, so how do you, how do, you do this? Um, uh, you use the zpool attach command, uh, just like you would to attach a device to a mirror. Um, so in this case, we're attaching this, device, this disk to this VDEV, uh, RAID-Z1-0. The dash zero is the VDEV ID which shows up when you do Z pool status. Um, it works with all different RAID Zs, one, two, and three. Um, you can do multiple expansions, so you can add one disk and then add another disk and add another disk. Um, and it, it will work in the background and show the status with Z pool status, show the progress with Z pool status. Um, but this is still a work in progress. So uh, RAID Z expansion is still a ways off from being integrated. Um, I'll talk about kind of where I'm at in a few slides. Um, the RAID-Z device has to be healthy during the reflow. So uh, what does that mean? Um, silent damage is still okay, so uh, up to the parity limit, of course. So like if, you, if you have RAID-Z3, it's fine if, you have, if th three of your devices have accidentally been B0'd out. Um, everything will still work, it'll still expand, it'll still be able to detect that and reconstruct the data. Um, but uh, the key thing is that we need to be able to write to all of the drives. So if any disk is missing from your RAID-Z, then uh, we're, we're, we need to pause this uh, reflow operation uh, until the device has been uh, replaced and uh, resilver is completed. The reason here is that if we couldn't, if we can't, if we, if we like read from the old location and write to the new location, but the write doesn't actually happen, um, and all the writes to those new locations don't happen, then uh, we could end up with um, two sectors both missing from uh, one logical stripe. Okay, so what's the performance impact? Um, again, like we're, we're copying all of the data. We're reading it and then writing it to the new location. So obviously, this is a performance impact. This is not a, a free operation. But all the reads and writes are sequential. So this is much, much, much faster than uh, a scrub, for example. Um, after the reflow, there's also some, um, some overheads. Um, there's a small CPU overhead when, we're, when we are reading from the uh, expanded RAID-Z. Uh, because uh, of some kind of accounting overheads where we need to create um, IOs for each sector that we're reading to reconstitute it in the right way. 
uh, get, get everything back in the right order. Um, and uh, the re we need to, the combinatorial reconstruction is, uh, the, the problem space there is larger. Um, show of hands, does anybody know what this, is, what this is in RAID-Z? Probably, no, okay. So um, I'm a, uh, I think I have time to have a slight divergence into this. So um, if we take this example, you know, we, um, uh, no, in normal reconstruction, we know what device has failed. So like, if this disk dies, and then we need to um, do, uh, we, we, we need to, let's say it dies, and then we read this block, then we, we just read from these three sectors. We know that we need to read those because we know that this one is dead, and then we use this parity to, re, to recompute what this sector should have been. Um, but in, uh, if there's a silent corruption where we, ZFS doesn't know that the data is incorrect, then you know, we would read, read these three sectors of data and c calculate the checksum. We'd see that the checksum is wrong, but we wouldn't know which uh, sector is wrong. So we'd have to try all the different things that could be wrong. So we say, well, well let's, let's pretend that this, this sector is wrong and, re and reconstruct it using the parity. Oh, nope, we still have the wrong checksum. All right, let's pretend that this one is wrong. Compute that, compute the, recompute it from the parity, and then compute the checksum, and then we say, aha, that's correct. Okay, good. And then we can correct the data. Well, um, that's all well and good, but um, we, uh, we do that on a per logical block basis because the logical block is what we have the checksum of. So for example, if these two, uh, two rows were one logical block, then um, you know, if, if you damaged, silently damaged both of these, the same thing would happen and, and everything would be fine. But in the new world, let's say that you did this silent damage and then you did the RAID-Z expansion. Then, um, and then you read the block. We wouldn't know which data is wrong because you damaged it silently. We read the, we read the data and then we say, ah, checksum's wrong. Let's try and, let's try and see uh, which, let's try and recompute, assuming that this disk is, is actually has the wrong data. Nope, that's not it. Th how about this disk has the wrong data? How about this one? How about this one? How about this one? None of those would give us the correct checksum because it's actually sectors 15 and 19 that are damaged. So, in addition to trying each of those possible, possible damage patterns, we also need to try the like, diagonal damage patterns. So we need to try, like, what if 14 and 18 are damaged? What if 15 and 19 are damaged? Aha, there we go. That, that was the correct um, damage pattern to be able to reconstruct it. So it makes that reconstruction space um, much larger because this is uh, exponential in the, um, in the number of things that you're choosing among. Uh, for, for one disk, for RAID-Z1, it's like no big deal. But when you're talking about RAID-Z3, um, it's like th this can be very, very large. And you might wonder like, well, why don't you just always, I'm gonna run out of time. Why don't you just always try all possible reconstructions? Like whenever you're reading this, just try like, what if, what if 14 and 20, what if 15 and 18 are dead? Well, it turns out that, you know, if you have like a 128K block with a reasonable width RAID-Z, um, your computer will die before it would complete. Like, you know, MTBF of like a, a million hours is going to uh, occur before you could actually try all of, all of those. So that's why we have to be smart about which patterns we actually try. All right, cool. So um, the redundancy impact uh, is kind of the same as before. We, we're preserving all the data in parity, so, um, but we're not verifying the checksums. So again, transient errors could become permanent. Um, but at least with the RAID-Z, you know you can survive at least one, um, one error. And uh, th that, that's preserved you know, throughout this whole process. So you know, if you die in the middle of it, we still have all the parity. If you die after the, uh, if, if a disk dies at the end of it, we have all the parity. So um, even though we aren't verifying the parity while we're doing the reflow, it's still, as you mentioned, um, you know, whenever we do a read via the normal path, whenever we do a scrub, uh, we're verifying the checksums and we're able to do the, the reconstruction. Ah, so um, the, the last kind of operational impact is that um, when we do the reflow, we're reflowing the, the data exactly as it is. So the data to parity ratio is the same as it was before. So like with a four wide, you know, you'd have one, uh, four large blocks at least, you'd expect one sector of parity for every three sectors of data. Um, after we've done the reflow, that's, even though the 
there's now five disks. That's still true of all the existing data, but newly written data can, can use the new data to parity ratio. So in this example, we're writing this new green um, block, which has the, the like, correct new ratio of one parity for four data. Cool. So status. Um, first off, thanks to the FreeBSD Foundation, they're sponsoring this work. Um, the design is complete. I have some kind of pre-alpha preview code. Um, the on-disk format is still very much in flux, so don't use this on any, on any pools that you actually care about. But for testing, um, you can check out the uh, code review that I have out here. Um, and currently, uh, all the like reconstruction stuff that I talked about works, um, but the reflow all happens in one transaction group. So you can kind of think of this as like an offline-ish um, version of uh, RAID-Z expansion, because while the expansion is in progress, basically you won't be able to do any writes of anything else. So um, future work, I think I already mentioned, queuing up multiple devices to be removed. Um, we have a prototype, but it needs a bunch more work. If you're curious about this, uh, come talk to me or my colleague, Sarah. She, she did the work for this. Um, and then we talked about uh, being able to remove a RAID Z uh, group. Uh, OK, one, one, one last thing before I open it up to questions until we get kicked out. Um, I'm announcing the sixth annual OpenZFS Developer Summit. This is a conference that we have. Uh, once a year, it's in San Francisco. Uh, it's going to be September 10th through 11th this year. Um, this is a conference. Uh, it's primarily aimed at ZFS developers, but everyone's welcome. Um, this is a great place to come learn about all the new, latest, and greatest talks uh, about ZFS. So if you liked you know, this talk and other um, talks at this conference about ZFS, we have a whole two-day conference uh, just about ZFS. Um, talk proposals are due in uh, just about a month. Um, the, uh, so we'd love to hear about um, what you're doing with ZFS, uh, especially if you're developing new features. The kind of best, uh, the best received talks at this conference tend to be ones uh, by developers talking about um, new or in progress work that they're doing um, and, and telling folks like, why are you doing this? Uh, how does it help people? And how does it how does it work? How does it interact with other features? It's a great place to get feedback on work in progress as well from from the larger uh, OpenZFS community, um, and also. Uh, we still have sponsorship opportunities, so if your company would like to be known as you know, a key supporter of this very important technology, uh, then get in touch with me or um, uh, we have an email address on the, on the website. Uh, and there's a, a few folks that have already sponsored it, so thanks a lot, um, including the FreeBSD Foundation and IX Systems from the, from the FreeBSD community. Awesome. So uh, we have like one minute according to the schedule, but I'll take questions until, until somebody says that I need to get out of here. Slide about performance impact of expansion. Mm -hmm. um, is that uh, performance impact worse than what it would be if you set up the RAID Z pool with that many devices to be replaced? Yeah, so the after um, performance impact after reflow, this is all talking about like how this would be different than if you had just done it that way from the beginning. Um, it, and same with like the device removal, that, that's the impact after re removal is talking about like. As opposed to if you had just started the pool in the in in, the, in that configuration. So um, these are. That said, um, I mean these impacts are very very minor um, and, and if in that practice. If was important enough for me to care, I could just send and receive that. Um, the. I would get data re rewritten with uh, yeah, color. yeah. So like this only applies to the old data. So like any newly written data. The, these impacts don't apply to because the in, for the newly written data, the logical stripe width and the physical stripe width are exactly the same, so we don't have to do this stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll start over here. If I were to do a scrub, would that also move the penalty? Because once you scrub it once, it's future Yeah, so the question was um, could a scrub help mitigate this? Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, this is not currently in my implementation plan, but um, I would like to do that. Uh, you can basically, you can get rid of the second uh, impact here of the increased complexity of the combinatorial reconstruction. If we do a scrub and then we remember, ah, I've done a scrub since you did the expansion, therefore I don't need to try those like diagonal um, failure modes. Yes.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. So, um, if if you if, if we did the, if we verified the checksums as we moved it, then you wouldn't need this um, combinatorial additional combinatorial reconstruction. That said, I, I, I know that you guys are super interested in this. I'm super interested in this as well because it's like this is really complicated to implement, and like there's a lot of cool, tricky math to do here. That said, like the, the practical impact of this is pretty low in practice. Uh, well, no, it would it would be it would be a lot more time during the moving. Um, in particular, because with Raid-Z expansion, you must expand it in order. Like, you can't, you, we, can, we couldn't just like, so sure, we could go find all the block winders, that's like ridiculously slow, like you know it's from Scrub. Um, but you find them in some random order. So if we find a block pointer that's in the middle of the disk, well, we can't actually reflow that until we've reflowed everything before it. Because otherwise we might be stomping on top of some data that we haven't yet reflowed. So you'd, you have to like do this, and if you don't have infinite memory, then to, to, to store the list of all the block pointers in the pool in memory to insert them, then you have to actually do multiple passes of finding all the block pointers to say like, you know, I can only store a million block pointers in RAM. So first, traverse all the metadata and find the first million block pointers and then reflow those. Now, traverse all the metadata on disk again to find the second million block pointers and get those in memory and sort them. So it, it would be quite, quite complicated for, um, a, you know, a pretty, uh, to, to mitigate a pretty minor impact, which can also be mitigated much more easily by just doing a scrub afterwards, which is actually cheaper, right, in terms of the time, time expended. The other thing is, so each of these, both the, the stems removal and the raise expansion, are adding a new feature flag? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so these, uh, both of these change the on-disk format in pretty radical ways, so there will definitely be feature flags, and they won't be read-only compatible. You'll need to you know, you can only move them to systems that understand this uh, on disk format. I think maybe we have time for one more question. I see Dan here standing, ready to kick me out. Is there, is there one more question? No, okay, great. Thank you very much. <laughs>